Diane, thank you so much for coming on the Easy Prey podcast today. Hey, thanks for having me. I, I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Uh, can you tell myself and the audience a little bit about who you are and what you do? Well, um, I'm an investigative reporter. I've been in the business for a whole long time. <laughs> Started in radio. I'm originally from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, I left Albuquerque and went to work for National Public Radio in Washington, D.C. I read the newscast and wrote the newscast for All Things Considered for many years. Mm. And covered Capitol Hill. I covered the White House. I covered not the Supreme Court so much, the State Department a little bit. So have a good working knowledge of how our government works and does not work. <laughs> and then uh, as I approached a certain age, I said, you know, if I'm ever going to get into TV, I better try. So I did. And my first TV job was at WCBS in New York City, which was a, a little daunting because I really had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> so since then, I've done a lot of different television jobs. I worked for the syndicated show Hard Copy. Mm -hmm. I have worked for Court TV. I did a quick little stint right after 9-11 uh, anchoring on Fox, simply because all of their talent had been shipped abroad to yeah. cover the, the story that way. Um, wasn't there very long and then went to Court TV. And, you know, I'll tell you, TV and radio has changed so much. I'm, I'm a fact-based person, you know. So I started writing a syndicated column about 14 years ago all about crime and justice. That's my genre, crime and justice mm -hmm. issues. And I realized if you're in print, it's much more challenging, first of all, but you also get people, people who read tend to be much more intellectual and much more thoughtful. And I just liked that genre so much. So since then, I've written four books. And the latest one is this, We're Here to Help When Guardianship Goes Wrong. So it's just out. Awesome. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So can you describe like what is the definition of guardianship? Yeah, you know, it's confusing. I wonder if it isn't deliberately confusing sometimes, <laughs> but guardianship called conservatorship in some states like your state in California, mm -hmm. they call it conservatorship. It's the same thing. It is the court ordering outside help for a vulnerable person, someone who can't take care of themselves or is is somehow at risk in their life. Um, to make matters a little more complicated, within the system, there is a guardian who takes care of the person's personal issues. Where do they live? What doctors do they see? They pay the bills, you know, the little household bills. But then if there's a lot of money involved, and in many of these cases, there's millions of dollars involved, then a, a conservator is appointed. So it, it might be two different people in charge of the so-called ward of the court, or it might just be one called a plenary guardian, and that guardian takes care of everything. So that's what happens when, when someone is put into guardianship, and we can talk about how that happens, they immediately lose their civil rights because they're declared incapacitated. Mm -hmm. All of their money, estate, property, holdings, heirlooms, investments, everything is confiscated by the court. And this system has grown to the point where every year state courts, because this is all run by each individual state, they confiscate $50 billion worth of wards, property, estate, wow. every single year. 50 billion dollars so that's a lot of money floating out there and i'm sad to say that it has attracted the criminal element in many instances so so let's talk about when it when it goes right first so we can kind of mm -hmm. understand what 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 the system should look like when it when it's operating so kind of what are the circumstances under when a person goes under conservatorship or guardianship they're, you know, look, we're, we're a benevolent society. So wh when someone needs help, they're elderly, maybe memory issues, Alzheimer's, if they're disabled, living with a disability of some sort, if someone's had um, a traumatic brain injury or a stroke, then a petition is filed with a court. It's called an equity court, doesn't matter. Uh, the, a petition is filed by someone to the court saying, this person needs some protection. I want to help them, so please give me the legal uh, means to do that. 
anoint me, appoint me mm. to be their legal guardian or conservator, depending on the state. So that is a wonderful, a wonderful system, and we need it. And it works really, really well when a loving, trusting family member is named as the guardian. So, you know, an, a, a, an adult daughter is appointed to be her mother's conservator, mm -hmm. mom's a widow, she's kind of losing it a little bit. That's when it works really well. Uh, unfortunately, I've discovered, I've been writing about this in my syndicated column and other places for about eight years. And over the eight years, I have discovered that many, many judges figure that if a case comes to my courtroom, your family must be dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. You can't figure out what to do amongst yourselves. So I'm not going to appoint you as the guardian. I'm going to appoint a, a court-sanctioned uh, stranger to take over your loved one's life. Now, sometimes that works fine, too. There's lots of compassionate guardians and conservators out there. But there are a lot that are not compassionate and conservative, and they have dollar signs in their eyes, if I can be frank. And yeah. that's where the problems happen. So how does the judge choose who is the who they're appointing? Well, it's really up to the judge, mm. you know, and, and I must say, no disrespect to the court. I, I have great respect for, you know, cops and courts and judges, but these judges are not trained in these cases. They don't really understand what happens after you bang the gavel and put your stamp on a guardianship and make and establish it. So, and they are sort of, they're in a unique position because it's not a criminal trial. It's yeah. not a civil trial. It's equity court. There's no, there's no trial. There's no due process uh, guaranteed. There's often no witnesses called. He just gets a piece of paper, he or she, the judge, gets a piece of paper saying, this person needs a guardian. And they're busy. They they get this from an officer of the court. You know, some lawyer gives it to them. And they go, oh, let's see. Well, um, the, the son is stealing money from mom and, uh, and nobody's taking mom to the doctor. Wow. Okay. Guardianship. Well, I found that many of those petitions are either way exaggerated or contain complete lies hmm. designed to get the guardianship in process. And then once the guardianship is in process, the lawyers, the guardians, the conservators, the something called a court visitor who reports back to the judge, uh, the, the, the medical people involved, they all work together. And nobody tattles on any bad behavior that's happening because then they would be excluded from the process and not get to charge the fees. And you see, that's the point. Yeah. Everybody is paid for by the ward's estate. So, you know, some of these guardians charge up to $600 an hour. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Your estate can go pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah. So are there any kind of public cases that people would say, oh, okay, that's what was going on in this public case? Britney Spears, <laughs> you know, you look at Britney Spears and I have a chapter in the book with some new revelations uh, about her case. Uh, she was under guardianship almost 14 years. Mm -hmm. And I don't profess to know uh, what may or may not be wrong with her. I do watch her um, TikTok and her ex formerly known as Twitter. Uh, and I see this 41 year old woman in scantily clothed dancing on a pole. And I think, oh, this isn't quite healthy. Um, but she finally got her uh, guard, uh, conservatorship terminated mm -hmm. because frankly, there was this big movement of the Free Britney movement yeah. that brought it to the headlines. And she got to go to, in front of the judge, which is rare. Wards are often not even seen by the judge before the, the guardianship or conservatorship begins. And it was such heartfelt testimony. I remember it was over the telephone. It was mm -hmm. at the end of the pandemic. And she finally got out of, of guardianship, but most people don't. So that was the, the most public. Uh, in the book, there, there's um, a lot of instances, you, you may not realize, of celebrities who've been guardianized. And some of them worked out really well. 
um, Peter Falk, the actor, Glenn Campbell, the musician, oh. um, David Merrick, the Broadway producer, all of these people were put into guardianship. Um, and they're more than that. Casey Kasem, the famous radio personality. And, and at the end of their life, a guardianship was established and it allowed their children from a previous marriage to come and visit them. Mm. So guardianship can be a good thing, but that's not what this book is about. Yeah. This is about <laughs> the billions and billions of dollars over the decades that have been quite literally stolen from wards of the court. And nobody really keeps track of what's where the money is going, what's happening. They're supposed to file an audit every mm -hmm. year. Here's where my ward's money went. Many of them don't file audits for years and years. And, and many of them, when they do, there's no one to look at the audit. Yeah, the, 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 the audits money. aren't audited, so to speak. Exactly, exactly. So, so if I, so, I guess there's kind of two questions, the two two paths we can go down here in, in in some additional discussion. One of how is this? How can we do this properly when it needs to be done, and how can we protect our our relatives from it being done improperly, well, or with the system abused? Well, you know, the the first thing is let's make guardianship or conservatorship harder to establish. You know, this this was the most uh, startling thing to me. Anybody can go to a lawyer and say, you know, that person over there, I, they need help. They need to be guardianized when maybe they don't need to be guardianized. Mm -hmm. And there are plenty of lawyers around who will write up these petitions for guardianship. Now, what do I mean by that? Anybody can do it. I have a case in New York that I'm watching, an 84-year-old woman who lived in her rent-controlled apartment for 50 years. The landlord got the woman guardianized, got her out of the apartment so they could charge more rent oh. in that apartment. There's a mechanic in Texas who, this is a case from many years ago, several years ago, um, an elderly man who had classic cars he did a lot of work on the cars and the man owed him thirty, forty thousand dollars and wasn't paying. Well, the man had a little dementia. The millionaire had dementia. Mm -hmm. So the mechanic went to a lawyer and said, what should I do? And the lawyer said, oh, let's just guardianize him. You can be the guardian. And the mechanic became the guardian for a multimillionaire. It was stunning. Um, the family of the millionaire took them about two years and lots and lots of money to fight that. And they, they finally got that one terminated. So there, you know, anybody can file a petition, initiate a petition, mm -hmm. including the lawyers. I found many cases where people would go to a lawyer and say, um, you know, I need to change my power of attorney uh, designation, or I want to add so-and-so to my will. And the lawyer talks to them, gets to know them, gets all their information. How many children do you have? You know, where is your money going now? And then the lawyer can go and file for guardianship on that person. And oh, I, wow. I know, I know it sounds stunning. People think that that can't happen in America, but it does. I found cases where lawyers initiated these things in Florida, Rhode Island, Ohio, uh, Arizona, California, New Mexico. So it's happening all across the country. I'm sorry, I went for a field. Your question was, <laughs> what can we do to help people? Um, first of all, as a family, get together. You, you have a person who is at risk, elderly, uh, has a little dementia uh, or, or has a disability, and you're worried about what might happen to them. Get everybody together before it becomes an emergency and talk about it. If there's dissension, don't go to a lawyer right away. Go to family mediation. First of all, it cost you a lot less and maybe it'll work. And realize that if you're fighting in your family, and again, a lot of guardianships are started after family squabbles, um, realize that the person you're hurting is the person you're trying to protect. So if you're gonna mm. if you're fighting over your elderly widowed mother and it gets to court and there's a, a stranger guardian who's got dollar signs in their eyes and fleecing your mother, she's the one who's hurt the most. So get together as a family. 
if you are an elderly person like me, <laughs> get your camera out. Get your everybody's got a cell phone these days. Record yourself saying what you want. Mm -hmm. What do you want? Do you do you want a guardian? Which of your adult children do you want to be your guardian? Do you never want a guardian? Do you have enough money to just hire 24-7 care to come into your home? Who's your power of attorney? What are your intentions? What do you want out of life? And put it on a videotape. Because that, once introduced into court, is pretty compelling. And judges then have to sit back and say, oh, maybe I shouldn't just rubber stamp this guardianship. Um, so, 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 so how do you get that into court if evidence isn't required in court for a guardianship? <laughs> it's, hard. it's hard, and and you, lots of judges will say to family members who show up after the guardianship has been established because that's mostly done, you know, in private behind a closed door. Um, you have to have a lawyer to talk to me. So now you have to hire a lawyer to talk to the judge because he won't let you talk to that person. But that's what you'd have to do. Mm -hmm. And then another Pandora's box. Good luck trying to find a lawyer who's going to take on another lawyer in front of a judge who's probably a lawyer. So it's it's a catch-22 situation. And every state is trying to pass some reform laws. Mm -hmm. You see, these, these guardians, when the family complains, they can go back to the judge and do it all the time and say, you know, that that daughter, Sally, she she's a problem. She's really upsetting her mother. I need to isolate mm. this elderly person from that adult child, you know. So Sally's banned. And mama could die all alone because Sally has been banned by the guardian. That's how powerful they are. So again, it's family harmony at all costs. If If you can achieve it at all, you know, how can you get your video in? You have to hire a lawyer. So that, you know, it's just a terrible, when it's good, it's really, really good. Because a family guardian knows exactly what this person wanted yeah. out of life. They know their hopes and their dreams and what they want to do, you know, what their bucket list is. But um, a stranger doesn't know any of that. And if you let a stranger take over, and I'm telling you, it's happening more and more family members are not being appointed as guardian. So beware. So uh, you were talking about, you know, states are working to kind of put some more guardrails on this. Is there a national movement uh, kind of behind the, the, the legislation of changes in the, in the states? Or is it really just kind of piecemeal, you know, people talking to their legislature and saying, this is what happened to my my family member. We need to change this. And then there's going to be this patchwork of vastly different <laughs> rules around this, or is there kind of this unified push of getting consistent rules? Well, a little bit of both, but mostly it's a mishmash of different laws in different states. Um, and, and some states have many more problems. Florida is a terrible state for guardianship because there's so many rich elderly people who retire there. Mm -hmm. So many targets for the unscrupulous. So states are passing reform laws um, against isolating the ward. You have to let the family come in and visit. Um, there, some are trying to get caps on how much can be charged in court fees. Again, when you have a guardian, a guardian ad litem, a conservator, a court visitor, and they all charge fees, I, I mean, your estate can go poof right away. Yeah. Then they put you in a home, they sell your house, so they put you in a home, and the taxpayers take on that burden. So, uh, yes, there are states that are passing these little Band-Aid laws, as I call them, but they're putting them on a big open bleeding wound yeah. called guardianship. And there's not one national law that regulates it. There's mm -hmm. no federal laws about this at all because it's a state's issue. There is a massive uh, push by a group called CEAR, C-E-A-R, um, Center for Estate Administration Reform. It's run by a, a married couple, Rick and Terry Black. Her father was put into a horrible guardianship in Nevada. 
And I, I urge anybody who's listening to this to say, this is happening in my family. What can I do? You can find Sear, C-E-A-R, on Facebook. Rick, Rick and Terry Black have counseled more than 5,000 families across the country on how, how to work it. What do you do? How do you save money not getting a lawyer when you have to get a lawyer? Mm -hmm. they're, they're, very, they're warriors in this fight. They're on Capitol Hill all the time. They go to different states. They were at the Free Britney movement. Um, and yes, there is a nationwide push, grassroots push for this, but there are a lot of scattered groups that frankly kind of snipe at each other. Um, there's also the National Association to Stop Guardianship Abuse, NASGA. So um, that, that's run by a, a wonderful woman named Elaine Renoir. She's also on Facebook. So there, there, are, um, there are resources out there. And on my website, easy, dianediamond.com, I have a whole section called Guardianship Central. And there are resources there, other books that you can read, articles. And I give you a glossary so that you can understand the terms you're going to be yeah. up against because they come at you fast and furious. And it's like, what's a court visitor? What's a guardian ad litem? Well, I already have a guardian. And so I explain that for you. Uh, I got some frequently asked questions there and write to me. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll help you out if I can. I'll, I'll get you to the right person who I hope can help you get out of an abusive guardianship if that's what's happening in your family. So how hard is it for kind of the, you know, let's use the, the Brittany example, how hard is it for the person who there is a guardianship of them mm -hmm. to petition to get out of it? Is that basically nearly impossible? Yes, yes, because they have been declared incapacitated. They don't have civil rights. Mm -hmm. So they, in most states, I think there are only a three that you get to have your own lawyer. You can hire your own lawyer, even though you're incapacitated, but you can't hire your own lawyer as the mm -hmm. war. So um, I was stunned when the Britney Spears judge allowed her to speak directly to the court. Well, that's unheard of. So how hard is it? It's almost impossible. You got to get a family member to petition the court because they are not incapacitated and you are. And so the kind of the, the unified family front is the the best route if, if there's a conservatorship by someone other than the family. Yeah, and I, look, I don't mean to speak ill of lawyers, but there are a lot of lawyers out there who operate within this system. And that's gonna be the first thing that they suggest to you. Oh, it's a panacea, go for guardianship, it's perfect. Because then you'll be in charge, mm -hmm. except you probably won't be. Well, that's a scary thought. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think it's one of those uh, anecdotes. That whenever there's lawyers involved, the only people that uh, end up the benefit is the lawyers. Exactly. Not, the, not, not to speak ill of lawyers. <laughs> not to speak ill of Not that there's anything wrong with lawyers. That's right. Uh, you know, a lot of people say to me, well, why hasn't this, why doesn't it change? Why doesn't the state legislature pass laws or revamp the whole guardianship system? And the answer is lobbyists, lawyer lobbyists, guardian mm -hmm. lobbyists, hospital lobbyists. Lots of times when there's a person in a hospital, their insurance is about to run out, a hospital will go for guardianship of the person. Even though there's family around, the hospital petitions for guardianship to get them out of there to free up the bed. Mm. So hospitals, nursing homes, lawyers, conservators, guardianship companies. There are whole franchise firms now that are doing guardianship work. They're all at the state legislatures knocking on the door saying, hey, you know, this, 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 the status quo is what it needs to just remain as a status quo. It's not us. We're here to help these people. Yeah. It's their family. Their families are so dysfunctional. They can't get along. Well, in some instances, that's true. But the, the guardian lobbyists want the lawmakers to think it's all the fault of the families, when in fact, it's much more complicated than that. Yeah. yeah. And it's, you know, I think that's true of kind of any issue is whoever has the most financial stake with, with uh, in the issue is going to do the most lobbying on whatever Capitol Hill it is. 
Right, right. And you know, when you could be a multimillionaire, <clears throat> excuse me, and your family fights uh, the guardianship, but realize it's you against a whole system. The judges get campaign contributions from the conservators and the guardians and the lawyers and the, you know, and the conservator always picks the same guardian to work with and they always pick the same hospital. And it, it, it's such a tight knit group. And again, they're not all corrupt. They, they, they don't all have money on the mind, but there's cadres of them in every single state that I looked at over eight years of investigation. And they have conferences. They have national conferences where they all get together mm. and and give each other tips. Yeah, well, here, here's a, an example of that. You're a guardian. Your wards are elderly. They start to have dementia. You've gone through all their cash. So now you go back to the judge and you say, Your Honor, I have to sell their house. Now, I know it's in their will that the house is supposed to go to Brother Randy, but I need money to take care of this person. And so the will gets busted mm -hmm. and the trusts and the irrevocable trusts are completely nullified by these judges. And so at these co uh, conferences of, of guardians, they there is a movement now where, hey, you know what? You should become a real estate agent as well. Oh, then you can sell that house and make and, a and you can get the commission on the sale of the house on top of the fees for everything the fees you're getting for being a guardian. So you're a guardian real estate agent. I'm seeing a lot of that now happen. There's a judge in Florida who's under investigation right now. It's a widely reported story out there in um, Polk County. The judge has been buying up these houses that were wards of the court's houses oh, gee. for way below market value. $450,000 house, he gets it for $300,000. $300,000 house, he gets it for $96,000. Uh, and anyway, you get yeah. my drift. Yeah. There's definitely a criminal element that can invade these sort of circumstances. And, and there is, as you would say, easy prey out yeah. there. And yeah. people who worked hard all their lives, saved their money. They got their will in place. They got their trust in place. They got a, a, a daughter who loves them dearly and wants to take care of them in their old age. And poof, it's all gone. Yeah, I, I wish there was, a, there was a nice, clean, well, here's the one thing that you can do to prevent this from happening. And it sounds like there's a number of things you can do to, to mitigate the risk, but you can't entirely eliminate Right. unscrupulous individuals well it's like you can't stop people from calling you on the phone with a nigerian scam yeah or uh, emailing you about the fact that if you just send me 500 dollars, you won a big lottery in the uk you know you can't control the scams and the fraudsters out there but i'll tell you what can be done prosecutors can start prosecuting these people uh, there are so many cases I ran into, you can't even believe, where the, the person is charged, here's an example, 200 counts of fraudulent activity, um, abuse of an elderly person, neglect, oh. et cetera. And by the time it gets to court, it's like one case, one count or two counts of uh, abuse of an elderly person, hmm. for example, and they get six months probation. So if we really want to stop this, start punishing the predators in this system. Now, sometimes that, that happens. There, there's a guardian in Albuquerque who got 47 years in prison, but she first, she and her company, her husband was in the company as well, stole $11 million, more than $11 million. Wow. There was a case in Nevada, a woman named April Parks. She got uh, 16 to 40 years in prison for neglect, fraud, embezzlement, et cetera. And you know, to show you how they're not supervised by the court at all, she hadn't filed audits in, in many of these cases ever or for oh, years. Wow. And when she finally went to prison, somebody bought up her storage locker that had gone you know, unclaimed. So people buy storage lockers, yeah. and, ooh, what's inside? Well, what was inside were the urns 
the cremains oh. of almost 30 of her wards. She just cremated them, no matter what their will said they wanted. Maybe they wanted to be buried next to their wife. She had them all cremated and put the urns in a storage locker. Why? Because she could. That's creepy also. <laughs> Instead of sending the ashes to the family or, you know, anyway, that's how powerful and unsupervised and ill-regulated this system is. It's 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 very sad. And I've, I've sat at kitchen tables and cried with people about what happened to their loved one many, many times. And um, we need to do something in this country to fix it. You know? More regulation, going after people that are criminal in their in their management of other people the going after the conflicts of interest and hey i'll become a real estate agent and get commission off of this yeah yeah or i'll become a uh, proficient in antiques and i'll know which ones to take home with me instead of putting them on the court inventory that you're supposed mm. to list you know um it's it's been quite a it's been quite a journey for me in investigating this and then finally putting it into a book form for everybody. I do have suggestions at the end of the book about what you can do um, and, and other alternatives to mm -hmm. guardianship. You know, why does it have to be it's, it's pendulum swing, full, strict guardianship with a stranger in charge? There's something called supported decision making, which is sort of like um, big brother, big sister a system of volunteers to help people mm -hmm. who need a little bit of help. Maybe they just need help, you know, paying their bills with, uh, in their checkbook. Maybe they just need help communicating on the telephone with people. Maybe they just need transportation help. Um, you know, there's a, there's a young man I know who at birth, uh, he was deprived of oxygen at birth, um, developed a mild case of cerebral palsy, and won about $2 million in a settlement as an infant. So the court, that is a New York case, um, assigned a guardian. So the parents didn't spend all the money. It's yeah. the Shirley Temple law, as yeah. they call it. You know, So the parents can't take the money. But when he graduated from high school, ready to go to college, 18 years old, that money was supposed to be his. But the guardian went to the judge and said, well, look at him, Your Honor. He walks funny and he talks but a little bit different. And yeah, you, know, you need to keep me on as a guardian. And the judge did oh. for for like six more years, charging the fees, charging the fees. And it was just last Christmas. His name is Michael Ligori. His story's in the book. Um, last Christmas Day, he called me and he said, It's over. Oh. I had to pay that damn, excuse my French. Uh, guardian, fifty-six thousand more dollars, but I just did it, and now I'm free. But by that time, they, they still don't know how much money is left in his account. Probably not much. Mm. Yeah, there's definitely unscrupulous people who will do whatever they can to get people's money, whatever way they can. Yeah, people ask me why I did all this and why I wrote this book because I don't like bullies. I don't like people who take advantage of other people, especially weakened people it just i was raised to think that that's not right yeah these are the people that you protect not the people that you take advantage of exactly exactly and and one more time if we started really punishing these criminals that are working within the guardianship system they would go somewhere else and do something else and stop preying on these people you know, Absolutely. one thing we could do is start licensing them there's only three states in the union that make guardians be licensed I found convicted felons that were guardians and people who just graduated from high school that were guardians and you know, require them to get some training. You know, the plumber that comes into your house has to have more training, the certification, licensing than a guardian who takes over someone's entire life. Wow. It just makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so many industries where to maintain your credentials, you need continuing education in the field. Mm -hmm. You have to take annual ethics classes. Right. Like these, these sound like very simple things that uh, hopefully will get enacted everywhere. At least make them take a business course on how to manage finances <laughs> or, or how, you know, senior care uh, training or family dynamics or, you know, something. Now, again, some, many guardians have gotten themselves certified, mm -hmm. you know, 
frankly, that can just be watching videos online for X numbers of hours and getting a certificate. But at least that's something, you yeah. know. It's better than nothing. In most states. Mm. Well, hopefully we'll uh, see a, a continuing movement uh, to get more responsible in the way that we take care of those that are in need. If uh, people want to find out more about you, where can they find you? Well, it's best just to go through my website, dianediamond.com. And if you note, there's no A in my last name, D-I-M-O-N-D.com. Um, I've just sort of revamped my website to feature this particular book. Um, and there's at the top of the website, the navigation bar, there's something called Guardianship Central. And that can put you in touch with all the people we've been talking about here. NASGA, SEER, uh, there's one more I should mention, the Spectrum Institute, which is r right there in California, a man named Tom Coleman, and they um, represent for the disabled community. Um, they're all about the fact that we have an American with Disabilities Act. Yeah, they're supposed to get equal treatment under the law, not get put into guardianship, conservatorship. So um, Tom Coleman is a, another warrior in the in the cause. So I have all their contact information on my website. Awesome. And we'll also make sure for the audience that we'll link those in the show notes so they can find them directly as well. Uh, link to your website, link to where they can buy the book if they want to read more of these stories. And if you buy the book and you think it's worthy, please put up an Amazon review. <laughs> I'm told I'm told that that really uh, helps support a book. So I, I really appreciate that. Absolutely. Diane, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for all your time and for your interest in this topic. You're welcome.